During the years at the aquarium, Manx Radio won a loyal following on the island, while its presenters, most of whom were fairly inexperienced youngsters, became well known to the listening public. Newcomers to the station included Bernie Quayle, Louise Quirk, George Ferguson and Daffy Don Allen. Light music and news items were the main features of the station and the UK's tabloid Sun observed in January 1968 that Max Radio's four disc jockeys working from rooms below a billiard saloon on Douglas Promenade were putting out programmes that included requests, a swap shop, a lost and found service and Melting Pot, a programme in which listeners can ring the studios with queries that have ranged from removing stains in tablecloths to cooking kippers. However, there were experiments with more serious and educational items. In the autumn of 1967, an ambitious series of talks were planned by Dr R.K. Gresswell, a senior lecturer in the Department of Adult and Extramural Studies at Liverpool University. Advertised as University on the Air programmes, these consisted of 20-minute talks on a variety of historical and geographical topics and included contributions by staff at Liverpool University's Marine Biology Station at Port Heron, as well as the Manx Museum and National Trust. The series was introduced on the air by the Lieutenant Governor Sir Peter Stallard and in the opinion of Dr Gresswell it was the first time in the British Isles that any university had organised and produced a series of lectures for use through radio. The aquarium studios were attractively sited in many respects because they were very accessible to the general public who could see into them from the other side of the plate glass aquarium tanks. The station had advertisements on the pavement outside and people could and did wander in and out. The only major drawbacks were that it was generally impossible to park a car nearby and that the studios were rather dark. Inside the studios, Ray Joyce had a private office, as did Laurie Quayle, the programme controller, and there was a desk for Margaret, the receptionist. There was also a postboy and a gopher called Wally. Bill Kane, the commercial manager, ran the sales department, while Pam Brocklehurst wrote many of the scripts, and Ros Charlesworth was the advertising logging clerk, who laid down how many commercials had to be broadcast and when. Some members of the Manx audience had started to become critical. Despite the fact that a great many of the young announcers were actually Manx, one listener asked the examiner in August 1969, who runs Manx Radio and who is responsible for the appointment of announcers? Some of them seem to be of any nationality except Manx and consequently quite frequently make a hash of the pronunciation of Manx place names and even surnames and names of firms and so on. Over and over again I notice these mispronunciations which do not reflect credit on Manx Radio and make a mockery of its claim for a wider reception over part or parts of England. Have we no Manx men who are capable of announcing? And in any case, those who are selected should undergo a speech training course and should ensure that they have the correct pronunciation of Manx names and places. In February 1969, Manx Radio received notice that its tenancy agreement at the aquarium would soon be terminated. This was a blow because there was no obvious place to move to and the expense of equipping new studios would be considerable. However, Peter Hyde discovered that the old HMS Valkyrie building on Douglas Head, used for radar training during the war and subsequently used as a workshop for Kelburn's electrical business, was available for rent until 1972. There was plenty of room inside the building and lots of car parking space outside, while an added bonus was the elevated site, which provided spectacular views and a good position for a VHF aerial mounted on the roof. Ray Joyce, Ewan Leeming and Charles Webster began the formidable task of equipping the building with suitable studios and machinery, working at first in very cold conditions and using paraffin heaters. At first only the top floor was used by Manx Radio, with the middle floor used as storage for wartime radar equipment. Ewan Leeming did a great deal of the joinery, installing the large turntables, tape recorders and Spotmaster mixers that had to be acquired from the USA because they were not obtainable in the UK. It took most of the year to complete the work and the move from the aquarium was not made until October the 23rd. The psychological impact of the move to Douglas Head was very considerable. 
Grandly named Broadcasting House, the new building was impressive and the studio facilities up to date, while its staff, looking down at the wide sweep of Douglas Bay set out before them, one of the best views on the island after all, could reasonably feel that they had a real mission to accomplish as the nation's station. Whether they could operate at a profit, however, remained to be seen. Yeah.